You're listening to the Monday Market Highlights brought to you by Milford. Good morning. It's Monday the 12th of March and I'm Roland from Milford. The key economic news was non-farm payrolls in the US, which were much stronger than the market expected. Employment increased by 311,000 jobs versus 205,000 expected. The monster January job ads of over 500,000 were also not revised down by much, which was a surprise. The unemployment rate, however, ticked up to 3.6% versus 3.4% expected as the participation rate increased. This is a positive development given the participation rate in the US had remained stubbornly low. In addition, average hourly earnings grew only 0.2% month on month, versus 0.3% expected. So the market remains very tight, but at least for February, it didn't flow through to wages. Earlier in the week, Federal Chair Jerome Powell testified in front of Congress. Generally, this is political posturing. However, he restarted his hawkish narrative, highlighting they would accelerate rate hikes if they had to. This saw US two-year bond yields jump to over 5%, the highest level since 2007. This saw a sell-off in risk assets globally, which was exacerbated by the issues in the US regional banking sector we will discuss later. Domestically, the RBA raised rates by 25 basis points, which was in line with market expectations. They did, however, change the commentary in their statement, which suggested they were considering a pause in the near future. This is on the back of the monthly inflation data and the weaker employment print. We believe seasonality impacted the employment statistics, and the monthly inflation data is wrought with issues. The monthly inflation print measures less than half of the quarterly statistic and is skewed to goods rather than services, and as we've seen globally, the inflation risks lie in services, not goods. We believe the RBA is trying to engineer a soft landing, which may prove to be difficult if the US continues to raise rates and we pause as the rate differential will lead to some currency implications. The Bank of Japan held rates at negative 0.1% in Kuroda's final meeting as the BOJ governor. There was some speculation he'd step away from the ultra-easy monetary policy he has been responsible for given inflation issues. However, this was not the case. He now hands the reins over to Ueda after 10 years as governor. As I'm sure you've deduced, we're seeing rate paths and central banks' policies diverge globally. In fact, we've had 290 global rate hikes over the past 12 months. Now, turning to equity news, we witnessed the spectacular collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in the US. If it is to fail, it would become the second biggest bank collapse in history. We will spend a bit more time on this. Silicon Valley Bank was the key bank for venture capital firms and tech companies, particularly startups. They had $169 billion of deposits and 40% with startups. As companies were unable to raise fresh capital, they were continually drawing down on these deposits. The issue was SVB's assets were invested in long-duration instruments like government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. They actually had the highest concentration of these securities of any bank. Now, given the rapid rate rises, all these assets are worth a lot less. However, you don't realize that loss unless you sell them on the market. Because they were going into deposit outflow, they had to sell these assets at significant losses. On Wednesday evening in the US, they announced some of these losses as they sold a $21 billion portfolio of assets at a $1.8 billion loss. They also announced a share proposal to raise $2.3 billion of funds to cover this loss and shore up the balance sheet. This spooked its depositors who started to withdraw funds at an accelerating rate, which would of course require SVB to sell even more assets at a steep loss to fund these withdrawals. The shares fell 60% on Thursday and were in a halt on Friday. The preference shares are trading at two cents as it's very likely equity holders will get nothing. The FDIC has taken control of the bank to ensure an orderly winding down of its assets. The FDIC insures deposits up to $250,000. Now unfortunately, over 96% of the bank's deposits are not insured or exceed this limit. The insured deposits will be paid on Monday. However, the uninsured deposits will receive a receivership certificate for their claims. They will be paid, but the payment will likely be delayed and they may not receive their entire deposit. These certificates can be traded and will likely be traded at discounts. In terms of other implications, the obvious concern is whether this causes contagion and sees other banks fail. There are an estimated over $600 billion of unrealized losses sitting in the US banking system. However, it's important to note the large US banks are extremely well capitalized relative to the GFC. The risk as we see are run on the smaller banks that don't have as much liquidity as the big banks, but very few have the same risky exposure to tech startups that SVB had. 
We saw yields fall on Friday, given there was a flight to quality, and many are now questioning whether the Fed can raise rates much higher given the stresses appearing in the system. We will see banks compete more aggressively for deposits so they don't themselves experience heightened deposit withdrawals. Another question is, does credit become less available? This has far-reaching implications if so. An example are commercial real estate businesses that are highly geared. If the banks no longer lend to these businesses, many could fail. There are also likely serious implications for the US startup scene, given how many companies exposed to that sector will be caught up in this issue. Finally, there's also a scenario that government steps in to ensure there is no contagion. At this stage, there is a lot of uncertainty. We do know, however, that the banks are in a much better position than they were pre the GFC. Domestically, we saw car sales raise $500 million to buy an additional 40% stake in Web Motors, the number one online auto marketplace in Brazil. Car had owned 30% since 2013, so this increases their stake to 70%. They overraised and reduced their gearing to 1.9 times. The acquisition is expected to be EPS accretive in time. We also saw Zero announce 7 to 800 layoffs as they look to control costs more effectively. This equates to about 15% of their workforce. They also announced they expect to have a lower cost to revenue ratio than expected in FY24. Zero rallied 11% on the news. Looking to the week ahead, we will be focused on the outcome of the Silicon Valley bank debacle and will closely monitor any developments to detect potential contagion risks. In the US, we get a wave of economic data, including CPI, where the market expects 0.4% month-on-month inflation, the monthly PPI metric, which is expected to increase 0.3% month-on-month, and finally, retail sales, which are expected to fall 0.3% month-on-month. In New Zealand, quarterly GDP data will be released, with the market expecting 3.3% annual GDP growth. Here in Australia, we have February employment data. Employment is expected to increase by 48,500 and the unemployment rate is expected to fall to 3.6%. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.